What are the most important things that IA firms are looking for in a new field or remote adjuster? Can you handle flood claims as a newbie? And the latest with AI and machine learning in claims. In this video, I chat with Richard Folkman, who's a VP of CAD operations at Crawford & Company, about you getting up and running as an independent property adjuster, starting now. This is Adjuster TV, adjusters first. Hey, Matt here. As we dive into the heart of hurricane season 2024, everybody is waiting, holding their breath to see if the dire predictions from the National Weather Service and Colorado State University are going to pan out. Learn how you can stand out and be ready when or if the call comes. You know, the biggest thing right now for everybody is they're, they're all waiting. They're waiting to see what's going to happen. But keeping your training sharp. It's going to cost you time, and time is money in this business, basically. Um, yeah. You know, closing claims quickly and accurately um, are going to make you stand out as an adjuster, as opposed to just closing claims. A lot of adjusters think, just close, close, close. And it's like, no, it's the quality. It's not the quantity. It's the quality and the quantity. Yeah. You don't get additional claims until you've started closing claims. So a lot of people are like, why am I not getting any more claims? You know, I've got 50, but everybody else has, you know, 75. Well, they've, they've closed 25. You get know, all the damage the first time. Carriers hate yes. supplements. Hate <laughs> supplements. Um, you know, it creates a bad experience. And, you know, um, carriers are more concerned about the customer experience than anything else right now. Because they're trying to retain their market share. And if, pe if people aren't happy, they're just going to go someplace else. And it costs them too much to get those guys you know the big one is we're in the customer service business everybody's like well i'm an adjuster i adjust it's like no you're a customer service person yeah you write claims that's part of the job is you write claims but really it's all about at the end of the day they may not get everything they want but they feel like somebody took care of them because they've been yeah. paying your premium for 30 years and they finally have a claim and was I treated like a customer for 30 years or was I just treated like you're just a client? So, and that's what will make an adjuster stand out, really. Yeah, for sure. I, I often tell people that you're there to support the relationship between the customer and the insurance company. That's not... The well, you're the face. You are the face of the insurance company. At yeah. that moment in time, it doesn't matter what commercials they've watched or anything else they've seen, you're... Yeah, you are the ambassador for that carrier, and how you act is a direct reflection on them. For sure. So I guess maybe let's kick off a little bit with uh, talking about flood and NFIP. There's uh, especially new folks, they have a lot of questions about, you know, can they do flood claims as a new person or do they have to wait four years? And what's the process for becoming, getting your FCN? And, and the other thing can be, you know, we've got adjusters who, you know, they don't want to get on roofs anymore. So what am I going to do? And a lot of them just don't understand flood and the opportunity that's there. Because if they have adjusting experience, four years, they just have to go through that one day class and fill out an application. And they're, they're ready to go. So, and there just aren't enough flood adjusters out there for when the big one comes. We don't have enough certified flood adjusters. So is there like emergency licenses and things like that? They talk about it. They haven't done it in a long, long time. They don't want to do it because then they're just shoveling somebody in that has no experience to deal with, you know, what is a complicated process. So it's not like property where you have that, that you have the emergency licensing. This is a federal program and it's certifications and, uh, you know, every time I've talked to FEMA, they're like, no, we're never doing that again. You guys will have to figure it out with what you have. You need to get people in and doing it because it, it was a nightmare. Every time they've done it, it's been a mess. It lasts for years and goes into litigation and they just don't want to do it. What it sounds like is, um, is that there's a need for flood adjusters, um, maybe like acutely, like right now, um, but there's kind of a shortage of people who have enough experience to to qualify for the program. Right. Or that, that, that know about it. And the other problem is now you can't get certification until next year. Door closed 
June 30th. It was May 31st, and they extended it a month this year. Um, so what we have is what we have until next year. And come January, everybody should be applying. It's interesting. Gotcha. They should get right on it so they can be part of it because they're going to be on the sidelines watching this year. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> that'll be interesting to see how that goes, yeah. especially if uh, we get a big one. Um, so what are what like so so say somebody can get th they can become flood certified. What sort of expectations should they have? Like just normally, just month on month or year after year, you know, excluding like big events like hurricanes. What is the the workload look like for just a it's regular so adjuster? That's what's interesting about flood. Flood is kind of like you do your other work, and floods like the cherry on top for your year because it pays pays really really well when it happens. Yeah. So. Um, it's not a constant. It's not like property and wind and hail where, you know, you constantly have those. We have small little spots that pop up where we'll have events in every state. I mean, we've been to Alaska four times a year, you know, but there's not, it's not like you have a bunch of claims. It's just like one-off claims. Um, the big thing for flood is when we have a, a larger event. Um, that's, that's when, you know, you come in and you work for a month and you leave a big smile on your face. Um, if you did your job right, you're pretty happy. Yeah. Um, anybody who's ever looked at the fee schedule for flood will understand that real quick. Because Congress decides, I mean, they make the decision on it, so it's the same. It doesn't matter who you're working for, it's the same fee schedule. Um, I mean, that's that's what enticed me. First time I did some claims and I was like, Dang! Hot dog. <laughs> this is pretty good. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> what about um, private flood? Is that something that's like got any legs? It's starting forward? to. We're starting to see that. Um, uh, you know, it's really being pushed by the government because they'd rather not be in the flood business or in the insurance business. Sure. Um, so we're seeing some of it, but it's still, it's still in its infancy. Um, you know, Insurance companies got out of flood for a reason because they don't have the ability to print money. Um, right. and that, that's really what got them out of the business years ago. And now with all the data and anal analytics, they can kind of look at things and go, well, you know, this is worth the risk. This is worth the risk. Um, and there's a couple players that are starting to really dip their toe in pretty deep into it. And then there were some small ones. There's already one that um, went through in and just they were out. They, they had those claims come through in Florida and they said, yeah, we're all done. We're not, we don't, we're not messing with this anymore. No more of that. No, no. Wow. So, uh, and that's probably what will end up happening is they'll, they'll slowly get deeper and deeper into it. And then suddenly we'll have a massive event right. and their losses will be just astronomical. And uh, they're, you know, their shareholders are going to go, what were you thinking? Yeah. You just risked all yeah. my money for this. So get one of those big system parks over the Missouri River and or the Mississippi River and Yeah. Then you got what yeah, was that, nineteen ninety three, ninety two, that that big flood hit? Yeah. The Mississippi. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges too is um the American people just don't understand flood and so they don't take out policies. They just assume it's not gonna happen to them. And yeah. so there's just a small percentage of homes that actually have flood insurance. And I was just watching, uh, uh, I watched a TV um, interview with a guy and he was mad because he said, you know, I'm not required to have flood insurance and my, fl my house flooded and now I have all this damage and I don't have a policy. And I'm going, you live in Florida. Everybody is in a flood zone. You're not in a special flood hazard area, but you're in a flood right. zone. You can buy an Exxon policy, which is the cheapest. I mean, it's like your Starbucks bill for a year would have paid that policy and got $250,000. He's like, but I wasn't forced to get it. And uh, it's like, Wow. Jeez. Wow. Because <laughs> if you're forced, it's going to be thousands of dollars, you know, potentially. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, you, you could get a, you, 
you can get off easy. You just, you know, 800, 900 bucks and you would have got a quarter million. So, yeah. So what would you say to adjusters that are interested in flood um, and come January, they want to jump on it? Like, what can they do between now and then to, to prepare, to be like the most prepared for that? You can get flood? them online to FEMA's website uh, to, uh, to their flood NFIP website and look, and there's some videos and stuff in there. We do host um, fast training, which is flood adjuster specialized training. It's something that I created that helps adjusters, especially property adjusters, understand there's a, there is a difference between flood and property and just even the basics of how you write the claim. You know, property starts from this, the roof down and flood starts from the floor up. So it's just simple things like that. But then really understanding the policy, what's covered, what isn't covered. And we don't charge for that. It's, it's free. It's a day-long class. Um, and we host those off and on throughout the year. That will give you a really good understanding overall of flood. We also were at NACA. We do it at NACA every year. Um, and then we can also help you if you come to us um, flood operations at us.croco.com and say, hey, I want to apply for my um, my certification, we'll send you a link and you can fill everything out and then we'll look at it and we'll say, hey, you need to make sure you fill this in or you, you answered this incorrectly, this is what it should be. And then we send it back and then they send it in. We don't send it in for them, they send it in, but we kind of help them through that stage sure. because we know what they're looking for. So we try and help the adjusters out with that. And uh, uh, and then, you know, it takes a couple weeks. They got really fast last year at turning around the FCN cards for new people. Uh, it, it was going really quick last year. So they got all the bugs out of their system. Uh, and then, you know, you can attend as many fast trainings as you want. You know, we've had hundreds and hundreds of people attend those trainings. Because, um, again, you need to... The, the more you know, the faster you can close claims, the faster you can close claims, the more claims you get. So, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but they've got to be good quality claims, right? Yes. Yeah. We don't want people just throwing stuff at the wall and yeah. want everybody else to fix their, their issues for them. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about property then. So you you guys have... I know you've got a lot of resources for adjusters, for new people and for experienced people. Um what does some of the training look like that you have for people coming in, you know, off the street? We've been doing, um, you know, and and I think we've discussed this, but last year I did the um, Cat Adjuster Academy here in Allen, Texas, and we brought brand new people in, never had ever done claims before or had been a couple of years since they had worked claims, and we put them through a training class here to get them up to speed. Um I, when I got into the business, I was just thrown into the business and it's like, figure out how to close claims. Yep. And uh, I'm completely against that. It's, it's a disservice to the client, to the yeah. um, policyholder and to the adjuster. And the stress level is like nothing I have been through in my life was as stressful as that. So we put these training programs together and um, we just did another one. We're working on our field deployments um, and getting people ready for that right now. And we just hosted where we actually paid adjusters to come into a training for four weeks. I paid them to wow. be here. Nobody does that. And yeah. we did it because I want to have a nice, good core group of adjusters that we can put out in the field and, and, and grow that part of our business even more. And so we constantly are doing different types of training. Will that be available again in the future? I don't know. Um, I need to test it out and see how it works. But pretty much we always invest in the adjusters to make them better because um, it's a direct reflection on us. If they go out and fail, then we failed, and we failed them. It's kind of – and I've asked this of other I firms, and I'm a little bit – I've been a little bit surprised. or I was initially surprised by the answer, but I don't think I will be you know, going forward. But basically – are you able to kind of speak to what the split is between field roles and the remote desk stuff? Like what's, you know, is it like 50-50 these days you got field adjusters and remote or is it? 
well, some other it percentage. Kind of, it, you know, it changes and everything. Keep this. The one thing about this industry is it's constantly changing. Um, so for years and years and years, it was all field. Yeah. And then COVID had an impact. And, you know, people want people in their homes and things like that. And a bunch of adjustments were made for inside. Now I'm seeing it kind of balancing a little bit, but it's leaning back more towards going out to the field again, I think. Um, okay. Because the customer, it, again, it's the customer service aspect. If you're just talking to somebody on the phone, it's hard to create a relationship and and get that good customer service feel going for you. So I really think that uh, the field is going to expand back again. I think it's going to lean more towards the field. But that being said, you know, when when adjuster finishes out in the field, they're they're done. There's going to be a tail on almost every claim. As much as we yeah. don't want supplements, there's going to be some things that are going to end up in supplement. We need adjusters then to come in and work inside the office and help us finish up those claims. Because, you know, we're always working our, ourselves out of a job. I mean, that's what we do. It claims in, you need to get them out, and then that's it. But, you know, when storms stack up, then people stay deployed for a long period of time. So so bringing people in afterwards, and then it, it just means you're deployed longer. And then there's a chance that if there's another storm, it's like, well, go back out to the field again. You know, you're up to speed on everything. We'll deploy you first. Let's go and send them back out. Yeah. So for the for the field role, is it like photo and scope, photo scope and write, and send it up to a desk person, or are they are are you are you thinking we're going to go back to like the old days a little bit more? I we kind of no, have this time. Every, everybody wants to be able to do it right there on site. I mean, that's that's yeah. the goal is to be able to close the deal right there. Um, don't impose on the customer any more than you have to. Is it realistic? Sometimes no. Sometimes it's too complicated of a claim. It needs more time. Uh, but I, I think you have to lean towards that's, you know, desktop settlements going to be or kitchen top settlement, table settlements are going to be the way it's yeah. going to go. Um, I think they'll try and head back that way. But, you know, it, it could flux. It just depends on what the carrier is sure. looking for. Well, and it's, this is interesting because, um, I mean, I've been in... I started in the insurance industry in 1999, so I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've watched a lot of things come and go, but it, the one, like you said, the one thing that's kind of remained the same is that the ultimate, like, customer service experience is to me to hand you a check, right, right at the house and be like, I made a coverage decision, here's your estimate, here's your check, agree with your contractor, you know, we're all done, right? And that, like you, we were talking about earlier, the customer service part of that, you know, um, that's a, you know, on a scale of one to 10, um, how likely are you to recommend, you know, safe code, your friends and family? I mean, and that's, that's all they're after. Um, so I, and, and I found in my doing it for 20 years that, and I was taught by state farm early. Like I, my first storm was a state farm storm, like a lot of people's were. And I was, they were like, you've they just hammered at home that you got, you, they want you to close on site. And so I just, I did. And I found that like, I had my evenings free, which is pretty cool, um, and I was able to turn over claims. I felt, you know, comparable to the fastest guy who who scopes all day and then writes all night. And I was doing it. I feel like in less time, even though it's you know, but um, I'm. That's interesting that you say that. Um, and I think that you know my my sort of sort of thought on it is we, we can't really see around the corner with the AI and machine learning stuff but there's a, I think there's a good possibility that it's instead of like AI taking over it's going to be that we're going to have these one click estimates you know or, or like AI assisted estimate writing from exactware or symbol or core logic or whatever where the tools that adjusters have are going to be a lot more powerful I mean right now with with Xactimate mobile that to me is a game changer. If I had to Xactimate Mobile when I was doing like especially sewer backup or like fire claims, I mean that was an absolute game changer because you get the diagram and the measurements at the exact same time of everything, the windows and all everything, and then I can take photos while I'm in there. I can drop a macro on it and then I'm done with the room. I walk close the door behind me. I'm gonna go to the next room. Right. Um, I I think that maybe because things have been so clunky for so long with all of the you know. It's, it's exact where exact made if you're if you're 
not used to it or, or you, you've let your skills kind of lapse a little bit, it's hard to get back up to speed with it and it's, it makes you slower, right? But if when they when this technology really starts to kind of, I feel like, and this is just me, but I feel like when this technology starts to kind of get really put into practice, that it's going to make one adjuster be as effective as two or three adjusters used to be and let them close a lot more do tabletop settlements or on-site closures like, um, you know, like we were, they really hammered on us to do in the past and hardly anybody ever did. Um, but yeah, I'm encouraged by that, that you saying that, because I think that that's, uh, you know, that's the way I always did it. And I think I always felt that that was the best way to do it. So as far as technology goes, because I get to see a lot of the new stuff and, sure. and I was always, you know, pen and paper guy sketching everything out. You know, pencil and paper, I yep. should say, sketching everything out. Um, and the technology now, we're, we're at the point where you don't even, and, and I, you see with exact and you stretch rooms and you put doors and windows in, it's going to be, you walk into a room and take a picture. Yeah. And it's going to do the entire room. It's going to do the sketch. Everything's going to be done. Your contents are going to be done yep. based on what's in the room. And then you just have to fill in blanks. But the whole point of where this is going to go and adjusters are like, oh, they're just going to have robots come replace me. And, you know, no. Oh. Now you have no excuse not to do the customer service. Now yeah. you spend the time. You explain the process. You you get to know the people a little bit because we've just saved you so much time. And you're still going to have the run and gunners. They're just going to want to close claims as quick as they can, and we'll just we'll just not use them because they're not establishing that rapport. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that. Um, so the efficiencies are going to be amazing. It's just the stuff that's coming is just going to be incredible. Yeah, yeah. I asked uh, the Exactware guys because uh, I, I was one day I was like sitting there drinking coffee in the morning and like, you know, checking email or whatever. And all of a sudden it's popped into my head. I was like, hold on a second. I know that with Xactimate Mobile, I can point it at these on the desk and it'll say glasses right below it, right? It, it can identify objects. What stops it from being able to identify, you know, the baseboard, the crown molding, the acoustic tile ceiling, all that stuff. And then even to be able to see like a water stain on the ceiling. I mean, how hard is it for the computer to see that, right? And you take a picture of it and there it is. And I thought, well, so writing an estimate, a, a, a restoration construction estimate is, is I don't think it's, it's anywhere near as complicated as writing code for like a website or for a program or something like that, which AI is doing. You can jump into chat GPT and if you want to do something right. cool on your website, just describe it and it'll write the code. And it's, it's perfect code, right? Um, and so I sent an email to uh, Aaron Bronco saying this. I'm like, how far are we from like one click estimating? And he goes, hey, let's get on a call in about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, how many assignments do you think we've run through exact analysis in the last 12 months? And I was like, it's, it has to be millions. And that's more than enough of a data set with pictures, measurements, I mean, notes, everything. And for for the machine learning to, to to run all through all those scenarios again and again, I mean, how many different kinds of downspouts are there, right? How many different kinds of, you know, window wraps or what? It's it's not rocket science. We're not putting satellites in orbit. So, but but you know, the the thing that's kind of the saving grace, I guess, for us, we ha the customer expects to be treated like a person, right? You know, it's, it's like you said, they 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 want to you know, feel like they were, they were treated like a person, not like a number. And like, anytime I got feedback on my claims, even if I had to deny a claim, the number one thing everybody always said was, I felt like I got a fair shake from your adjuster, yep. right? a fair shake. That's all they're after. Right. And you got to have a person there for that. You know, there may be some people out there that want to do it all through the app and don't want to talk to anybody. But I think that for the vast majority of people, they still want to, you know, especially if you got a contractor there or it's a large loss, right. right. You can't, negotiate with the contractor through an app. I mean, you gotta, yeah. there's gotta be a person there. Yep, so, exactly. What do you guys think about um, software certifications? Like, you know, CoreLogix, I think they've got a one and two, and then of course Xactor has got one, two, and three for ex the user certification for Xactimate. Is that something that, do you have any carriers that require that? Uh, no. Or does nobody care? 
No, we don't. We don't have anybody that requires it, but it's it shows us if you're going to take the time to go and and get certified and get that at least once and show us that you yeah. did it, then you you've delved into it and you understand the program enough to pass that test. Um, so yes, you know it's important that they do that because unfortunately we get people that come in here that they they haven't even figured out how to turn the program on. Right. And that is not the time yeah. for them to be taking claims, but they'll tell us, no. you know, I know, oh yeah, I know how to do Xactimate because I, I took one course in it, you know, they're not certified. Um, so that's, that's a problem for us. And it, and it comes down to how, you know, do you want to get chosen for a job? So what are you going to do for that? Training is a big thing. And you hear about this constantly, especially from us. And, you know, Training is top of mind awareness for us. If you're in our training classes, we see you, the instructors talk about you, especially if you're doing, you know, you're good at what you're doing, they're going to chat about it. And then we're going to find out about it. So, you know, you want to do that. One of the other things that, you know, all I hear from adjusters all the time is how do I get deployed? How do I get deployed? And then it's how do I stay deployed? You know, and again, we're always working our way out of a job. But one of the real important things for us is, especially if we're going to ramp up or we're going to have some big event come, is having the talent at a management level, so admin managers. And so we're always looking for people that have had experience leading others. And how can we take that person and move them into a position that when we get busy, our teams jump, we need more managers. And you can be a great adjuster and a horrible manager. <laughs> sure. But why? You know, you, you can't go with the guy that can close all the claims or the woman that can close all the claims and get them done, boom, 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 and they're great. And then put them into a leadership role and find out, no, they can't lead people. Right. But by the same token, I'm somebody that isn't a great adjuster, but is a fabulous leader and can get the people to do the adjusters do what they need to do and knows enough about it that we can teach them to be a better adjuster. And so what happens is we have individuals come in and move into a management position. And then when it slows down, we move them into adjuster positions because the team shrink. We don't need as many leaders, but we still need adjusters. So we'll slot them into the adjuster role and they'll drop and pay, but they're still deployed. And then as soon as we hit an event, they move all back up again. And maybe even higher the next time. So that's something that people really need to think about when you're doing your resume. Make sure you put in your leadership roles. You know, that's sure. uh, that would be a call to action is update your resume. Even if it was at a McDonald's and you let a team of four or five, that's a leadership role. You, you're responsible for their actions, and that type of training is meaningful to us. Yeah, for sure. And actually, that's so funny that you, you start talking about managers and leadership roles and stuff, And because that was going to be my next question. Um, so, and I, and I know that the next question after that is, especially from viewers, it's going to be, you know, what does that look like as far as you know, is that do they start off as like a field manager, or like a field support person, or they, and then they get like a team, become a team manager? Does it pay better or worse? Is it a day rate? If you're able to to kind of speak to like how they're compensated for that kind of thing? Yeah, they're compensated. Um, we we primarily do hourly. Um, you know, you still factor it as a day. What do I get paid in a day? Right. But it's it's hourly. Um, and yes, there's a bump in pay depending on what your responsibilities are it does go up. Um, whether it's field or inside admin manager, it's still kind of the same thing. You've got a team, maybe you have 10 people that you're responsible for. And, you know, that's that's like the first level of management that you're going to get into. And then, you know, depending on where you're at, what organization you're in, they'll call them segment leaders or they'll call them storm managers, they'll call them whatever. And you just have different tiers that go up. Um, in the organization that, uh, you know, that's, that's basically how it works. It's, it's pretty simple. So field doesn't, is it better than inside and inside isn't better than field, but still managing a team. Sure. So is there, 
is there like a, a role for like um, a person who's only in the field and kind of like assist adjusters out in the field? And then, or is there, is that, you guys do that? Yeah. I mean, we, we would have, it would be, it'd be the same structure inside and outside where you have a, um, an admin manager for the field, an admin manager for the inside. You'd have a segment leader for the field, segment leader for the inside, storm manager for the field, storm manager for the inside. So, yeah. Gotcha. So, and I guess my question was more like somebody who jumps in their truck and meets an adjuster at a house kind of a thing. Um, that's going to be all right. So you're talking like, like a TA, maybe somebody yeah. who needs to kind of buffer between an adjuster and, and yeah, yeah. We're going to have people in that, those roles too. Yeah. So, so that probably kind of falls more under like, it's like a personnel who, oh, what's that? It's, that's kind of like a supervisor, not really a supervisor, but more of an expert um, yeah. for that, you know. So they would be, so, so in other words, that's more, that's less of like a manager level and more of like right. a, like a help room team lead. people. Kind of like a team lead maybe. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So, so there are other, so in other words, long story short, there are, there are other roles that adjusters can, especially ones who have experience. Um, I was a TA on Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy or whatever. Uh -huh. and, I absolutely loved it. It was, I had so much fun. I didn't have the responsibility of the claims and I just was able to go out and meet, meet guys and gals on their, their roofs. A lot of new people were on my team and, you know, helping them go into their hotel room at night and like, let's figure out your schedule and get that all lined out. Here's what you can do tomorrow morning. Here's what you can yep. do tomorrow afternoon. Yep. And it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. I really loved it. And it was one, th it was one thing that kind of like, made me realize that I wanted to do more of like what I'm doing now, which is helping to train adjusters. But so, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this kind of um, brings up the the idea of like a adjusters or like a claims professionals, like career life cycle. Right. So maybe they start in the field and then they do, maybe they do some remote stuff or whatever. Maybe they become a manager. Like where can a person who is in the insurance industry on the independent side, like, where could they go with this? Okay. Let's tell you a story about a guy who, in 2011, um, was uh, basically turning 50, had been an entrepreneur his whole life, and uh, was like, man, I don't I don't have a 401k. I got to figure out what I'm going to do in retirement. You know, I don't want to keep owning businesses and uh, really don't want to have employees if I don't have to, because I've been dealing with that for a long time. Yeah. So they've got a relative that was in the industry and told them about it. It's a funny thing about adjusting. Generally, either somebody gets into adjusting because they have a relative in the business or they have claim and they talk to somebody and they kind of like, well, that's an interesting job. That's how they get yeah. into it. We don't, we haven't been able to reach out to the masses and, and bring people in just, you know, without those two experiences happening. Yeah. So, uh, first storm comes up, uh, 2011 ends up going out, um, got called out to do claims and, and it was had taken the training in July. It's already almost September, got on a couple of rosters, hadn't heard from anybody. They thought, man, I spent $1,500 to get my license and, you know, it's getting me nowhere. And then all of a sudden you get a phone call. Somebody puts you on standby. Somebody else puts you on standby. And three hours later, they say, you're deployed. Be in Philadelphia. And drive out there. Sit down in the training class. About two days into the training class, they say, this is a flood event. This isn't really a you know, wind event. No experience. Suddenly, they're made at that time into a flood adjuster. Spend the next nine years running out, running all over the country, doing claims. Are you talking about yourself? Me. <laughs> then uh, all of a sudden an opportunity comes up. There's a change with the company you'd worked for and they lost the client that, that you had worked for and you'd worked your way up to the top of the ladder as far as adjusters go with it. And now you have to start over again. And uh, yeah. so take a job opportunity is a, uh, Operations manager in 30 days become a director. So 2020, fast forward to 2023, become a vice president of flood 
and uh, carrier practice at that company. So nice. You can go from one place to another in a damn hurry. And sure. I would say that um, probably the biggest thing would be customer service. Always taking care of the customer, never saying no to dispatch, never turning down a job, making myself available all the time. Yep. And the opportunities just came. And then here you go. So how far can you go in a short period of time? Would have never yeah. thought it. Not in a million years. Sky's the limit. Never turning down a job, always saying yes, I think is, is one of the, the, the big things that helped me because even if it was, even if the dispatch told me it was a garbage deployment, because sometimes they would be like, man, I'm really sorry, but we can't find anybody else to do this. And, you know, yeah, man, just, where is it? And, you know, I'll, I'll go and t I'll take care of it, whatever yep. it is, right? That the reciprocity you get from that and then the goodwill and the relationship building the experience, right? And you have, you have an, another opportunity to, you know, it's garbage deployment. You know, it's one of those situations where you got a bunch of old wood roofs and there's really wasn't any hail. It was like pea size or something. And you got these a contractor in this little town just going just door to door and just like fighting everybody tooth and nail and, you know, making a big stink about everything. And you got to go into that scenario where they're, they don't know who to believe and everything and try to, you know, try to support that relationship between the, the insurance company and their, their policyholder customer. And that's a, that's a big challenge. And I think it's one of those things, you know, take anything that, that comes up. I, I often tell people, you know, if you're like, well, I really want to be, you know, just do remote and like be in my PJs or I call them bubble bath adjusters, right? They're just, they stay home and they, I mean, it's, who doesn't want to do that, right? Just just to like wake up in the morning and, and just like jump in your computer and just make money, right? And then there are people, there's a very a much smaller number who want to get out of the house. They want to travel. They want to, you know, like I did. I mean, I, I couldn't, I wanted to, I was waiting for my phone to ring, you know, and as soon as it did, I'm like out the door. Um but I tell people, I say, listen, you know, if you want to really want to do remote and you're physically able to, if they call with a field deployment, go, because it's going to be a great experience for you. And if you turn those too many of those down, maybe two, you're probably not going to get called again for anything, right? Because they're going to say, well, this person is, they keep saying no to us. They're going to be, unless, you know, Harvey and Irma hit and then everybody's got to go. Um, so I often tell people to do that and, and, uh, it's, I don't know, I get a little bit of pushback on it, but um, as far as like, the, the, one of the questions I get very often is, hey, I, I can't climb roofs. Am I required to? Can I use a drone? Can I get ladder assist on every single claim? Um, what would you say to those folks? You probably need to find a different career or you need to look at if you have the experience, get a flood certification because you're not getting on a roof with flood. That's one thing yeah. I can tell you. You're not getting on a roof. If you do, it's it's going to be worth it because that's a lot of water. But, um, yeah, it's I, I get this all the time with people like, well, I just got my license, and I just want to know if I can work remote. And it's like I got a building full of people that would love to work remote. Yeah. And it's not going to happen because until you are that good, then when you're that good, then you can ask for it. But – you're not going to get it right out of the gate. And that's, that's the percentage of people that I don't even want to waste my time with because, yeah. you know, they're not going to invest. They're not going to go to the trouble. You know, I, when I talk to people about, you know, turning down jobs, I tell them, look, dispatch looks at the least path of resistance, like lightning. Yes. So if they know when they call you, you just say yes, that is off their plate because they got a million other things to do. The faster they can take care of this and get that out of the way, then their job is easier. Their day is better. So if you make their day better a lot, they're going to take care of you. And when you get those crappy claims, and you just let them know, hey, you know, this one wasn't very good. If they don't already know, most of the time they, they'll they'll have looked at the FNOL and they know it's not going to be a great claim. Yeah. And you've got windshield time up the wazoo. But next time there's a cushy one, Guess what? I'm calling you first. It's usually yeah. how it works. Uh, I, I, it really is, and it's been my experience. You know, it's it's the the three hours one way supplement. 
contractors there, PAs there, attorneys there, the agents there. Every, it's, it's just going to be a nightmare claim. It's, it's been denied or you know, $75,000 what they want and the original adjuster wrote for $1,500, bucks, or whatever it is, right? Yep. And everybody's mad. And then... Then a little later, you get the, you get that call. Hey, we got an apartment complex up in Minneapolis. You want it? Three yeah. in jail. And I'm like, yeah. yes. Please. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I think uh, it seems to be in pretty much industry-wide, my, my sort of uh, taking the pulse from other firms and, and talking to you guys like Jeffrey and whatever, but that the remote stuff is super popular um, highly competitive. Um, and some people really, really, really want to do it and they're going to try. Um, what advice would you give to somebody if, if they, they just, they didn't want to do, or they can't do field, they have a disability or an injury or something like that, or they're absolutely terrified of heights, which, Hey, I mean, you can try to blame somebody for that. Um, I, what I tell people generally is, Get it. You need to be even more qualified and you need to start with licensing there. But is there a path, do you think, for a, a new person to to be able to get into remote uh, without going through field? You need to go through a lot of training. Um, you need to take some of these you know, outside classes, um, get that under your belt so you can sit at a desk and know what you're looking at. You can look at a photo and know what you're looking at because the photos – you know, when you're on the field, you can walk around, look at it at different angles and figure stuff out. When you're working in an office, you've got whatever photo was supplied to you to work with. You need to be able to read that. Yeah. Most of the time, that comes from experience that you can look at it and you know because you've taken the picture and you know the difference between looking at it with your eyes and looking at it in a photo and you can tell what the damage is or isn't. Um, but you're going to have to – you're going to need to get into a desk position – and you're going to be looking for an opportunity for desk deployment, and you're going to probably do it for a while in some remote town. Um, and then when you get to that point that you can work at home, that you can do. I mean, I've got people that will never go out to the field, never. Uh, yeah. We put them through our flood training program, our FACP program. They were terrified to go out and do the claims that they had to do to get certified. Um, they were just so happy to come back and work in the office again. Some people, that's... Other people, they want nothing to do with coming in the office. I will say, if you're an adjuster who's never, ever worked in office, you need to get a deployment in an office. You will learn so much. I, When I did it, the first time I did it, I was amazed at how much I learned. Because you get to look at everybody's estimate if you're doing supplements. So now it's like, whoa, I could be charging for this. I didn't realize that. Now my fee biller just went up because I'm more educated now. Um, you know, all the stuff I sent in was acceptable, but I could have maybe stretched that estimate a little bit further had I the knowledge yeah. that it did after working in the office. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that's, you know, if 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 you get invited to do cleanup on, on the field, same thing. Um, I think if there's an opportunity to do file review for you, yep. same thing, especially file review. Um, yeah. And that's, I you know. We could even say that just like on the dispatch side, if you're saying yes and you're, you know, you're, if you're not flubbing up the, the deployment or the claims assignments or whatever, and you're saying yes and you're and you're being a, a help to the that dispatcher. Same thing goes for file review. Turning in a high quality file that's easy to read and easy for them to, because they're gonna they're gonna know your name whether you, whether you're good or bad, and you don't want to be, you know, turn in 600 photos for. A, tree on fence claim and then you've you're there's there's 35 errors and corrections and then when you i don't know why this is maybe you can help me understand this adjusters that and i because i've done file review um and we we do have a file review process in our trainings um but they you get sent back a, 10 corrections and they will correct two of those and then send the file back up i'm like yeah. What about those other eight? And it's crazy because they'll want to argue. The ones that want to argue their point. <laughs> and it's your job's to do what you're told to do. You may not agree with it, but there's probably something you don't know. And yeah. that's why this decision was made. And 
Yeah, and if you waste everybody's time by doing three things and sending it back up, and then now they have to look at it and send it back down to you again, yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna be looking at getting deployments for very long, um, doing stuff like that. Um, and some people just can't let go of the fact that they're right and they know they're right and they're not going to change their mind. And it's like, it's not how this works. Yeah. You know, you, you, you stress the point, you put the F9 notes in of what your position is and how you arrived at that. And they make a final decision and then that's it. Fix it, change it. It's all, all the notes are in there of what you felt. Just do it and send it back up. Yeah. So, do you have so is there like um and I, I worked for a, a firm once um on a couple of storm or a couple of deployments where they they did collaborations like they wouldn't kick the file back for corrections they yeah. just fixed it and sent it through is that something that's carrier dependent I think it's carrier dependent um and I don't see um uh, I don't see that anymore I haven't seen that in quite a few years uh, okay. doing collaborations that was something we used to do all the time all the time until probably 20 2019 i think is the last time i saw that happening um yeah. but i'm sure there's still some that are doing it but yeah. we don't we don't do that anymore i hated that because i was like well i want to know because i don't want to have i want to know how to do it right the first time especially because if i'm exactly. building off of it and they added stuff to it yep. um if people want more information about how to get with you guys um, where can they go? Uh, they can go to www.croco.com. That's C-R-A-W-C-O.com forward slash cat. And then forward slash training will take you to our training site. Um, we do, um, on a regular uh, interval, every two weeks, we do a cat chat. And we do internal ones, and then we do some open to the public. And we'll post those out on social media. And you're welcome to come listen to different leaders from different departments and we just get on and talk about what's currently going on. If there's any opportunities, deployments and things like that. We just think it's important to stay in touch with the adjusters all the time. So I invite everybody to come join us for one of our public cat chats and uh, get to know the rest of the team, not just this, this ugly guy right here. Want to know what makes a great adjuster who has the best chance of earning six figures? Find out in this next video.